Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Claire, and thank you, Ian. It's really a wonderful pleasure to be here at Drake. My first, I've been in the airport before, but never have seen this really beautiful town with the rivers and the bridges. Uh, it's a nice place, I think, to live. Uh, well, as you know, America's founders have a special significance for, for uh, us Americans. Celebrating in the way we do uh, this generation that fought the revolution and created the Constitution is peculiar to us. I talked about this this afternoon briefly with, with some of the students. And, and no other major nation uh, honors its past historical characters, especially characters who existed only 200 years ago, in quite the way we do. We want to know what Thomas Jefferson would think of affirmative action. Or what would George, these are the kinds of questions I get asked. What would George Washington think of our invasion of Iraq? As far as I know, the British don't have to check in periodically, would say, with either of the two William Pitts to find out how Gordon Brown's go government is doing. Uh, we have a special need, I think, to, to, to need for these historical, authentic historical characters to find out what do they think of us? What lessons do they have to say to us? And, and I think the question I want to ask is, is, why should this be so? Now, scholars have a variety of answers. Some suggest that our continual concern with constitutional jurisprudence and original intent um, accounts for our fascination with the founding and the making of the Constitution. But that would be true of, of constitutional scholars like Ian and, and, and the Supreme Court, but that's not true for ordinary people like the rest of us. But others think that we have these 18th century, we honor these 18th century figures in order to recover what was wise and valuable in our, our past. I think we believe that they had a, they offer a gold standard of political leadership that somehow we haven't kept up with and we need to be reminded that there were great men back then. Um, I think the question we ask is, why don't we have leaders like that today? Others quite sensibly think, and this is the one I think is most important, is the interest in, the, in this, this generation has to do with a, our sense of identity as a nation. The identities of other nations, say being French or German, are lost in the mists of time and usually are taken for granted, which is why I think those nations are having such great trouble with immigration. We think we have troubles with our immigration, Mexican immigration. But our troubles pale into insignificance compared to the problems the Europeans are facing and will face because they have an ethnic base to their nationhood. And, and they can't believe, these French, for example, can't believe that these Algerians, these Arabs who have been living in their country for three generations are really French. They don't look French. We know we have the whole world here in America. And so we don't have that problem to the same extent. And I think uh, that makes, that's because of this peculiar founding generation. We became a nation in 1776, and thus, in order to know who we are, we need to know who these founders are. What did they do to create this nation? We were founded on a set of beliefs, um, and not, as other nations, out of a common ethnicity or common religion or a common language. Um, we are non not a nation, in other words, in the usual sense of the term. And in order to establish our nationhood, we have to reaffirm and re reinforce periodically uh, our, the values of the men, the ideals, the institutions that these men created. In other words, to be an American is to believe in something, not to be somebody. And to believe those things that we believe in are the ideals, the ideas, equality, liberty, constitutionalism, pursuit of happiness that came out of, and the institutions of government that came out of this very, very important moment in our history. And, and, and so as, as long as the republic in, endures, I think we're destined to go back and, and examine these, these founders. Now, they were an incomparable generation, despite what Tom Brokaw said. I, I think this is the incomparable generation. They were the greatest generation. Uh, the succeeding generations of Americans were unable to look back uh, uh, at them without a, a sense of, of awe, without being overwhelmed by the creativity of their politics, the sheer magnitude of their achievement. They were larger than life. Uh, 
giants uh, in the earth. A forest of giant oaks is what Lincoln called them. Uh, they seem to possess intellectual and political capacities well beyond those that, that followed them. So what were they like? Why were they different? What made them different? Now, great as they were, they were certainly not demigods or, or superhuman individuals. Uh, they were very much the product of peculiar circumstances and, and a, a particular moment in time. Nor were they immune to the allures of interest that attracted most ordinary people. They wanted wealth. They wanted status, like other human beings. They were not demigods, but they were not Democrats either. Certainly not Democrats in any modern manner. They were never embarrassed by talks of elitism. They didn't use that term, but they were certainly not embarrassed by their high status. And they never hid their sense of superiority to ordinary folk. But neither were they contemptuous of ordinary folk. Uh, in fact, they always believed that people in general were the source of their authority. That was what the revolution was about. They were going to destroy monarchy and become republics. Uh, and republics were based on, on, on the people. We had a moment, I guess, in our history where we had a nice balance between what you might call aristocratic and democratic values. But even in their own undemocratic time and circumstances, they were unusual, if not unique. Uh, as political leaders, they comprised a peculiar sort of elite, a self-created aristocracy, largely based on merit and talent that was unlike, very unlike, the hereditary nobility that ruled 18th century uh, English society, the society they broke away from. Now, 18th century Britain remained under the authority of about 400 families, noble families, whose fabulous scale of landed wealth, political influence, and aristocratic grandeur was unmatched by anyone on this side of the uh, Atlantic. While Charles Carroll of Maryland, one of the wealthiest planters in, in the American South, was earning what the Americans regarded as the huge sum of 1,800 pounds a year, the Earl of Derby's vast estates in England were bringing in an annual income of over 40,000 pounds. And then when you look at, um, say, uh, the Duke of Ra Rockingham's house uh, in Northumberland, was 650, this is his country house, 650 feet long. That's longer than two football fields. Now compare that to Westover, William Byrd's house in Virginia. Some of you may have seen it. It's about 90 feet long. So the scale of, of the English aristocracy was way uh, uh, ahead of anything we had. By English standards, our aristocrats like Washington and, and Jefferson, even with their hundreds of slaves, remain minor gentry at best. And by the English measure of status, lawyers like John Adams, whom we're honoring here, and, and Hamilton were even less distinguished. They were gentlemen, no doubt, but nothing like the English nobility. So the American elite was very different from the uh, English aristocracy. By, but it's very different, however. Uh, I think it, 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 that difference made it ideally suited to exploit the peculiar character of what historians came to refer to as the 18th century enlightenment. Now, this Anglo-American enlightenment was preoccupied with politeness which had a much broader meaning for them than the term has for us. It wasn't just simply manners. Uh, it, it implied um, affability, sociability, cultivation. In fact, politeness was considered to be the source of civility, which soon was broadened, uh, much to Dr. Johnson's lament, to, uh, to, to the word civilization. To, so to be polite was to be civilized in the broadest sense of the term and implied a social process. Societies, it was assumed, moved through successive stages of historical development, starting with hunter-gatherers. And you know, maybe in your geography course in your seventh grade, you had this hunter-gatherers moved up to herding uh, of, of sheep or cattle, and then to agricultural stage, and then the final fourth stage, the commercial stage. And all nations could be located along this spectrum of, of social development. Since civilization was something that could be achieved, everything was enlisted in the 18th century in, in order to push back barbarism, ignorance, and, and spread civility, refinement, civilization. Now, all sorts of new organizations and instruments sprang up in the Anglo-American world to spread light and knowledge among people. 
learned societies, lending libraries, debating clubs, assembly rooms, reading groups, generally magazines, concerts, galleries, museums. The 18th century, in other words, saw the beginning of culture as a public commodity, as something that was valuable, that gave status, and could be acquired. In other words, the cultural world that we're familiar with, of concerts, museums, and so on, was born in the 18th century. That's what, that's what the Enlightenment was about. At the center of this new civilized world was the idea of a gentleman. Defining a proper gentleman was a subject that fascinated the educated public of the 18th century. Uh, and writers from Richard Steele, Addison and Steele, the Roger de Coverley papers, to Jane Austen, spent their lives struggling with what constitutes a proper gentleman, the proper character of a gentleman. Indeed, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson in their retirement years debated this issue. What's a real aristocrat? What's a real natural aristocrat? Or what's a real gentleman? Uh, and in their correspondence to the end of their lives. Now, for many in the 18th century, including the revolutionaries, being a gentleman assumed a moral meaning that was much more important than its social significance. Pure monarchists might still define aristoc aristocratic uh, gentry uh, exclusively by the pride of their families, the size of their estates, the lavishness of their display, or the arrogance of their bearing. But others increasingly downplayed or ridiculed these characteristics, wealth and breeding or, or, or bloodlines, and wanted to emphasize merit and talent and virtue. Think of Jane Austen's novels, particularly Pride and Prejudice or, or Emma. That's what she's obsessed by. All of her novels focus on what is the proper gentleman. And, and the whole issue of Pride and Prejudice is, is Mr. Darcy, in the eyes of, of Elizabeth Bennet, a real gentleman. Sure, he has 10,000 pounds a year coming in. He's got bloodlines, Lady the Burg. He's got purple blood. But Elizabeth Bennet, which is uh, Austin's stand-in, doesn't, doesn't care about that. She wants a man of character. She wants a man of taste. And that's what, her, that's what her book is about. And that's what her other books are about. She was fascinated by this definition of a proper gentleman. Uh, and, and that, I think, is the best way to read Jane Austen. She's very much caught up with this uh, idea. So they, they wanted to emphasize new man-made criteria uh, uh, for, for aristocracy, for gentility, politeness, grace, taste, uh, learning, character. That's all that Elizabeth Bennett cares about with, with Mr. Darcy. She doesn't want to know about uh, how much money he makes. Even to the point, I think the emphasis was so great in the 18th century that even those um, aristocrats like Lord Chesterfield uh, like to think that their exalted social status came from their talent, not from the fact that they inherited their title. They, that was embarrassing to them, to feel it, it, was, it, came, it came in this artificial way. They wanted to feel that they were there because of merit. So to be a gentleman was to think and act like a gentleman, nothing more. It meant being reasonable, tolerant, honest, and virtuous. It was a prerequisite to being a political leader. It signified being cosmopolitan, standing on elevated ground in, in order to have a large view of human affairs, being free of the, of the prejudices, the parochialism, and the religious enthusiasm of the vulgar uh, and, and the barbaric. It meant, in short, having all those characteristics that we today sum up in the idea of a liberal arts education. In fact, the 18th century in the English-speaking world created the modern idea of a, of a liberal arts education, which we still, I think, at places like Drake and, and my own university at Brown, uh, that, that's what we believe in. And it's to create this kind of, in fact, if you ask someone in the 19th century, you know, what's the purpose of going to Brown or going to Harvard or any of those institutions back then, they would have said, to create gentlemen. Uh, that's the purpose. Uh, we've lost some of that clarity, but the fundamental basis of a liberal arts education is to create a cosmopolitan person lacking in paro to, to avoid parochialism, to avoid uh, narrowness of mind, uh, to have all of these characteristics that the 18th century valued. Now, this age-old distinction between gentlemen and commoners had a vital meaning for this generation, this revolutionary generation, that we today have totally lost. I mean, we put gentlemen on our restroom doors. Uh, it doesn't have any of the meaning that it had for them. 
but it divided their society. Uh, it, 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 this, this hierarchy it was divided by this line that almost as sharply as the line between officers and, general, and, and commoners, the soldiers. And, and of course, the, the, the distinction is still maintained, officer and gentleman. Uh, today, an officer is supposed to be a gentleman, and a gentleman is going to be the officer. He's not going to be the common soldier. Um, now, these gentlemen constituted about 5 to 10 percent of the society, 5 percent in the South. It's much harder to be a gentleman in the South and then in the North. Uh, and, and those were all those who were, who were wealthy enough not to have to work, at least not have to work with their hands. Uh, even the lawyers didn't have billable hours the way a modern attorney would have. And they spent a lot of time. If you read Jane Austen, you know they have these dinner parties. Nobody seems to have a job. They don't have any <laughs> occupations. Either they're in the military or they just seem to be able to come to dinner you know, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And, and that's what a gentleman did. He, either political leadership or involved in military service, but they didn't go to the, didn't go to the shop and, and work. Um, they were able, those who were able to act in a disinterested manner in promoting the public good. Now, disinterestedness was a crucial word for this generation. It was a synonym for virtue, which meant the ability to rise above your selfish interests and, and, uh, and, and serve the public. Uh, it meant, um, it, it was a synonym for the classical conception of, of self-sacrifice. It meant being impartial. Now, we've lost that meaning. I think uh, I find educated people, that, you know, educated publications, New York Times, Washington Post, use disinterested as a synonym for uninterested, not caring. And, and you'll find people using that all the time. And of course, in the modern dictionary, would say uh, uninterested and disinterested are synonyms. Uh, although there is an older meaning of disinterested being impartial. But in the 18th century, those two words would have been very, very distinct. Disinterested meant impartial. It didn't mean not caring. Uh, and and uh, uninterested is a very different word from disinterested. Now we've blurred them. It's almost as if we can't conceive of someone being disinterested. Um, I think there are only two occupations left in the country that we count on, on the, the, the people being, being disinterested. Can you guess what they might be? Occupations that of disinter disinterested? No, I don't think that we expect them to be disinterested. <laughs> judges, I think, I think we still hold out that judges are, are going to be disinterested. That is impartial. Now, we have our doubts about that, because you can see these uh, Senate hearings cause problems over an appointment to the Supreme Court. So we even have doubts about judges. But there is one group left where we have utter confidence, almost utter confidence. Otherwise, the whole world would fall apart if this occupation weren't truly disinterested. Can you guess? <laughs> what, what, what was it? I missed that. No, not librarians. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean. No, not teachers either. Oh, teachers. Umpires, you're right. Umpires and referees for our sporting events. Think of it. If these people weren't truly disinterested, our whole sports empire would collapse. There was a crisis in the NBA when they found out this one uh, referee was, was uh, well, he was betting, I guess. But that was enough to almost shake the whole foundations of the sport. So we count on. I mean, a kid grows up in Boston, and he's a Red Sox fan, and he becomes an umpire, and he's you know, umpiring a rank Yankees Red Sox game. We just count on, I mean, if you're from New York, you would count on him being disinterested, meaning he would rise above his emotional and, and local connections and, and make a disinterested judgment. That's what they meant by disinterestedness. It's a rare quality. And we count on it, I think, for our umpires and and referees. I think there's nobody left but them that are truly disinterested. But that's what they counted on. That's what they meant. Washington used that term over and over again to describe his own characteristics. They had an obligation, these people, these gentry, to serve the public. Uh, and, and because of their talents, their, their independence, their social and moral preeminence. Now, as aspiring gentlemen, the leaders of this generation shared these assumptions about work politeness, and civilization. Indeed, they were primed, I think, to receive all of these new enlightened ideas about civility, about gentility. More so, I think, than the English themselves. They shared this uh, 
these, these feelings with, with another group in the great pan-British world, the Scots. Uh, I think this, these kinds of values had a special appeal for these people living on the edges, if you will, the provincial edges of the, of the British Empire, the underdeveloped provinces of the British world, Scotland, North America. There are several ways in which they are similar. Both Americans and Scots were provincial peoples, uh, as I say, on the periphery of the metropolitan English world. Both provincial societies lacked the presence of the great hereditary noble families that were at the ruling centers of English public life. The nobles in Scotland, after the Act of Union of, 18, of 1707, moved to London, where the action was, and left Edinburgh and Glasgow under the control of, of minor gentry or intellectuals at, at the universities, like Adam Smith and others. So you have a very similar kind of society from North America. Minor gentry in control. Uh, in both North America and Scotland, uh, they, they, these were people who were anxious to have their status determined less by their ancestry or the size of their estates and more by their talent, their, uh, their, their behavior, their learning. Uh, so that's one characteristic. A second, both the Scots and the North Americans were acutely aware of the contrast between civilization and the nearby barbarism of the Highland clans in the case of the Scots and the Indians in the case of the uh, North American uh, Englishmen. Uh, those Indian tribes and the, the, the clans of, of, of the Highland clans were considered to be savages. And, and those people living in the lower... Uh, Lower Scotland were looked upon them as, as, as most uh, uh, Americans, white Americans, looked upon the Indians as savages. Both, too, of course, were keenly aware of the degrees of civilization, and they spent a great deal of time writing and, write, and, and, and reading essays on the stages of social progress, from rudeness to refinement. You have endless numbers of uh, commencement addresses in North America on that theme, rudeness to refinement. How do civilizations develop? And it, they were acutely conscious of this precisely because they knew how it all began. As Locke said, all, at the beginning, all the world was America. He's referring to the fact that the Indians uh, in the hunter-gathering stage of, of development, un, in some peculiar sense, frozen in that stage. And the, the proximity of those Indians or the Highland Scots gave uh, both, both North Americans and the Scots an acute sensibility, you know, a sense of, of how fragile, if you will, civilization was. Uh, they knew they lived in cruder and more simple societies than the English, and that England was well along in the fourth and final stage of social development. That is, it was well along in this commercial <laughs> society and had much to offer them because of its development, its maturation, in the ways of politeness and refinement. Yet at the same time, both the Scots and the Americans knew only too well that the polite and sophisticated metropolitan center of the empire was steeped in luxury and corruption. England had sprawling, poverty-riven cities, over-refined manners, gross inequalities of rank, complex divisions of labor, and widespread manufacturing of luxuries, all symptoms of, of over-advanced social development and social decay. England, in the eyes of both the Scots and of the North Americans, was on the verge of social disillusion. I think the sense of, of, of discrepancy is very important for uh, their sense of, the, of, the, of themselves. Uh, so they began to feel, both these provincial peoples began to feel an acute ambivalence about being part of the British Empire. They were proud of their simple native provinces, but keenly aware at the same time of the metropolitan center of civilization that was London. Uh, so both of them, both the Scots and the North Americans, are living simultaneously in two cultures. Now, I think that, that can be unsettling to people. And maybe living in Iowa, looking at New York, you might say, well, this is a similar kind of experience you might have. It's unsettling. It's, at the same time, it's stimulating and creative. And I'm going to give you some examples from 20th century novel writing, because I think it helps explain what I'm talking about, why these two places in the provincial world of Britain should have been so creative 
at the end of the 18th century in a way that Britain itself was not. England, as Gibbon said, was full of complacent people. Oxford was just so complacent. They didn't have a single idea on their minds because they were at top of the world. They didn't think freshly. They had nothing new to offer anybody. But in Scotland and in North America, you had an outburst of creativity. Now, why should that be so? I'll give you the analogy with novelists. Think of at the beginning of the century, the Midwest. Think of the, the novelists that came out of the Midwest, Dreiser and Sherwood Anderson, Sinclair Lewis. Growing up in, in uh, Minneapolis or Chicago, acutely conscious of, of Midwestern culture, but knowing at the same time that there's this other world in New York or London gives an ambivalence to your feelings. You're, you're, you're aware, you're proud, or you're part of your, your consciousness is, is your provinciality, your sense of, of being a Midwesterner. But at the same time, you're aware that there is another world out there as well. And, and that's unsettling. It's disturbing, but it's creative. And, and then you can look at other groups. Think of them. Southerners. Why should the Southerners have been so creative in novel writing? Faulkner, Dora Wealthy, Flannery O'Connor, you can go on and on acutely conscious of being Southern, a Southern culture, and yet aware that there's a Northern and, and a larger culture in New York or London or else, elsewhere in the Western world. Blacks, same kind of thing, very conscious. James Baldwin, Toni Morrison, Richard Wright, Ralph Well, you know the, the, the numbers. It's that combination of being conscious of your own provincial culture, being black in America, but also knowing that there's a larger white culture that you uh, our intention with. Uh, and, and Jews, think of the Jewish writers, Saul Bellow, Philip Roth, Malamudi. They go on. It's that same situation. And, and the, the clincher, of course, is the Irish. I mean, think of uh, from going back from Jonathan Swift to, to James Joyce to the present. Why should the, the Irish have been so creative in novel writing and in creative writing? It hasn't, it's not in the genes. It's in this situation, they're growing up in a world where they're, 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 they're writing in English in many cases, they're, they're thinking in English, but they're, they're Irish, and they know that there's another world. They're proud of being Irish, but they know there's another world in London uh, that, that's, not the, that's a metropolitan world. And that tension is creative. It's disturbing, it's uncomfortable, but it's also creative. And that, I think, is what these uh, provincials in both North America and Scotland Experience the Scots, you know, had a, a, an outburst of creativity that rivals our own, if not surpasses it. You know, David Hume and Adam Smith, Adam Ferguson, John Millar, a whole Lord Kames, a whole group of of writers who really founded modern social science, come out of the late 18th century. Why should this be so in Edinburgh and Glasgow, and why should we have had Jefferson and Madison and and Hamilton and all this fresh thinking? on our side of the Atlantic. It has to do, I think, with this provincial uh, tension. They're living so close to what they regarded as savagery, barbarism, they were compelled, both provincial peoples were compelled to think freshly about the meaning of being civilized. And, and, and in the process, they put a heightened emphasis on learned and acquired values at the expense of the traditional inherited values of blood or kinship. Uh, they adopted these new ideas enthusiastically, these new ideas of gentility, uh, of what it is to be civilized, in a way that the English themselves, in their complacency, in their self-satisfaction, did not. Uh, and that, I think, uh, helps explain some of their uh, uh, creativity. Uh, they, uh, they developed a sense of, of character. Uh, they were character, not, not as personalities, as we would say, but, but their outward public personas, um, there, there was, was the outer life, the public person trying to show the world that, that, that he was living up to the values and duties that the best of the culture imposed on him. They committed themselves to behaving uh, in a certain moral, virtuous, and civilized manner because that's where their identity came from. Uh, and and in, in fact, the intense self-conscious seriousness, seriousness with which they made their commitment was what ultimately separates them from later generations of, of American leaders. But that commitment also sets them sharply apart from the older world of their fathers and grandfathers. They were men of high ambition, yet of relatively modest origins. And this combination made achieved rather than ascribed values naturally appealing to them. Almost all the revolutionary leaders, and I can't think of very many who were not, 
uh, were first generation college graduates. In their, co in their families, they were the first to go to college. And this meant that they couldn't count on what their parents had done. They couldn't count on their blood. It had to be merit that they would, would uh, judge themselves by. Uh, almost all of them were the first in their families to attend college. And, and they were the first to display the new 18th century marks of an enlightened gentleman. Jefferson's father, for example, Peter Jefferson, was a wealthy Virginia planter and a surveyor who married successfully into the prestigious Randolph family. But he was not a refined or liberally educated gentleman. He did not read Latin. He did not know French. He did not play the violin. And as far as we know, he never once questioned the idea of a religious establishment or the owning of slaves. But his son, Thomas Jefferson, was very, very different. He did all those things. And that, I think, is what separates this generation from their parents. Uh, they were eager to prove themselves by what they believed and valued, by their virtue and disinterested. And John Adams is no different. Father was a very ordinary person. John was the first in his family to go off to Harvard and, and acquire uh, a, a liberal arts education. But there was one prominent revolutionary uh, leader who did not seek to play that role that the others did. And, and he, he becomes the exception, in a sense, that proves the rule. And I'm thinking of Aaron Burr. Uh, he had all the credentials for being a great founder. He was a Revolutionary War veteran, a Princeton graduate, and a charming and wealthy aristocrat. He eventually became a senator from New York and a vice president, the third vice president of the United States. His two predecessors, think of it, were, Thomas, were, were John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. And he's the third vice president. He had a tremendous career going for him. Uh, but something set his character apart from his colleagues. He inherited his claim to leadership. John Adams said that he had never known in any country the prejudice in favor of birth, parentage, and descent more conspicuous than in the instance of Colonel Burr. Burr was the son of a president of Princeton and the grandson of another president of Princeton, that none other than Jonathan Edwards, the great 18th century theologian. Burr said Adams was connected by blood with many respectable families in New England. Unlike the other leaders of the revolutionary generation, in other words, unlike Jefferson, Washington, Adams, Hamilton, Madison, Franklin, Burr was born fully and unquestionably into whatever nobility and gentility 18th century America had. Unlike the other revolutionaries, Burr never felt he had to earn his aristocratic status. It was in his blood. He just assumed it. And as a consequence, he never talked about virtue. He never talked about disinterest, being disinterested. He didn't think that that was important. He just, it was a very different kind of person. He assumed that this kind of leadership was due him simply because of his inherited uh, status. As a consequence, he behaved very differently. Aristocracy was in his veins, in his blood, so to speak, and he never forgot it. And, and, and he behaved very differently, especially in promoting his own selfish interests. He was elected senator from New York, but he found that he couldn't make any money. He was, lived very high on the, uh, the hall. He was spending money like an aristocrat should, but he never had earned enough as an attorney to, to, to cover his uh, high standard of living. So he became a senator from New York, but being in Philadelphia, where the capital was in those days, in the 90s, he couldn't earn any money, so he left the Senate, retired from the Senate, and went back to the House of, of, of Assembly in New York where money could be made. In fact, he concocted this uh, charter for, uh, for a uh, waterworks, which seemed like a very disinterested action for the city of New York. He's going to build a waterworks. But what really what he had buried in the charter was the plans for a bank, would be his personal bank which became, of course, the Chase Manhattan Bank. Uh, that's the ancestor of the Chase Manhattan Bank. But that's what he wanted. He was, he was conniving at every step of the way to earn some money for him and his followers. And he, he never saved his correspondence. He didn't care about fame, which in Hamilton's mind was, was his greatest uh, fault. And in the end, from both ends of the spectrum, from Jefferson on the left, so to speak, and Hamilton on the right, they brought Burr down. They destroyed him. Uh, because he was not 
their kind of revolutionary leader. Uh, even Hamilton, who, who, uh, who, who had no reason to like Jefferson, he says he said to Marshall, he wrote to John Marshall, he says, I, look, I hate Jefferson. I fear him. I, I, he's a terrible man. But compared to Burr, he, Burr has no character whatsoever, has no principles. He says, Jefferson has a modicum of principles. And therefore, in that disputed election, you remember in 1800, the Federalists could go either way. They could have supported uh, Burr, and Burr would have become president. Because it was a mistake. Burr and, and Jefferson ended up with the same number of electoral votes, and it was thrown into the House. And, and if the Federalists had got together, they could have pushed Burr over as president. Burr didn't ever said, I will not serve. He didn't say anything. And, and Hamilton worked relentlessly, writing letters to everybody, including Marshall, saying, you've got to come down on the side of Jefferson. Better Jefferson than Burr. And, and then, of course, Jefferson did not like Burr either. He was not his kind of Republican. And, and the two of them, in, a, in effect, destroyed him. Uh, he is, I think, the, expe the exception that proves the rule. Yet I think the, the very high-mindedness of this this generation of, of leaders raises fundamental questions. If it was the intense commitment of this generation of founders to these new enlightenment values that separates that generation from other subsequent generations, why it might be asked, and, and it has been asked by, by recent critical historians, did these so-called enlightened and liberally educated gentlemen not do more to reform their society? Why did they fail to enhance the status of women or eliminate slavery entirely? Why didn't they treat the Indians in a more humane manner? Now, it's true that the founders did not accomplish all that many of them wanted. It turned out, of course, they did not control their society and culture as much as they thought they did. And they were no more able to accurately to predict the future than, than of course, we can predict our future. And in the end, many of their enlightened hopes and their kind of elitist leadership were done in by the very democratic and egalitarian forces that they had unleashed with their revolution. They live with the illusion that, first of all, that, that slavery would naturally die away. And at the outset, it seemed like it might happen. Um, the, Virginia was, had more anti-slave societies in the 1780s and 90s than, than the North combined. And as Virginia went, Virginia, we have to understand, in 17 uh, 87, 89 was the largest state by far. A fifth of the population of the country lived in Virginia. It was by far the richest, biggest, most powerful state. It's not surprising that four out of the first five presidents were Virginians. So as Virginia was going, and Virginia was manumitting slaves by the thousands, it seemed as if to many people that slavery was on its last legs and it would die away. Now, they couldn't have been more wrong. There, was more, there were more slaves at the end of the Revolutionary period, despite tens of thousands of manumissions in the North and the freeing of slavery, slaves in the North, which was not inconsiderable. The numbers were not, in, you know, 14% of the population of New York was, was enslaved. 7% of my own state, Rhode Island, was enslaved. So there were lots of slaves freed, but nonetheless, there were more slaves at the end of the revolutionary period than at the beginning because slavery was, was growing as rapidly as the white population. That is doubling every 20 years, faster growing, twice as fast as any population in Western Europe at the time. So, uh, and the, the, the attitude towards the Indians, if you look at what George Washington and Henry Knox, who was Secretary of War, said about how we should treat the Indians, even a modern anthropologist would, would endorse their, their sentiments. They wanted to save in Indian culture. But of course, they could not control, as we say, what was happening on the ground. And on the ground, very ordinary Americans wanted land, and they were just moving in in a helter-skelter fashion and, and contesting the Indians and causing bloodshed, to which the, uh, the, the capital had to respond with, with army, with forces. Um, so democracy and, and demography, if you will, um, did, undid the plans of, of the founders. All of the, uh, all of the founders thought that slavery was wrong. They all expected it to sooner or later die away. And, and they couldn't have been more wrong, of course. When even Southerners like Jefferson, Patrick Henry, and Henry Lawrence publicly deplored the injustice of slavery, from that moment, declared the New York physician and abolitionist E.H. Smith in 1798, the slow but certain death wound was inflicted upon it. 
Uh, now, they just didn't foresee the future um, any more, than, as they say, than we do. Um, now, such self-deception uh, by these leaders was understandable, for they wanted to believe the best. And, and as I say, initially, there was evidence that slavery was dying out. Um, and, and they couldn't have been, they just misread everything. It took the Missouri crisis, I think, to, to awaken people to how serious the situation was and how wrong they were. I mean, the South seemed to be on the way. Granville Sharp, who was a noted British and, uh, abolitionist, William and Mary awarded him an honorary degree in 1791. So you have to, how would you account for that? Well, because I think people thought that abolition was in the air by, in 1791. Ten years later, very different story. Gabriel's Rebellion occurred. The Haitian Rebellion occurred. And then Gabriel's Rebellion in Virginia. And that changed everybody's opinion. Uh, they thought that the ending of the international slave trade in 1808 would, would kill off the institution. There was a lot of hope placed on that. They thought it was being fed from abroad. But of course, that was all wrong. Uh, slavery uh, was, did not, North American slavery did not unlike Brazilian slavery, did not depend on importations from Africa or from elsewhere. Uh, Americans were, were reproducing. Slaves were reproducing at the same rate as whites, which was not equaled by the British working class until the late 19th century. So in the, base, in the basic demographic sense, uh, black slaves and, and whites masters were growing at the same rate. Uh, Virginia was dying as a as an economy. The s soil was depleted. Tobacco was no longer prosperous. Wheat was growing, but never really dominant. They never grew much cotton in Virginia. The principal export, by 1830, the principal export of Virginia was slaves to Mississippi, Alabama, to the Deep South. And, and it was not something that men could easily face up to. Well. The reason they took off slavery off the table in 1790 was because of this mistaken uh, faith in the future. As Oliver Ellsworth, who was the third chief justice of the Supreme Court, declared, as population increases, poor laborers will be so plenty as to render slaves useless. Slavery in time will not be a speck in our country. They simply didn't know the future. Um, and of course, whatever the leaders thought, it was nullified by what ordinary whites wanted on the ground again. Uh, so white planters wanted more slaves, and that counted more than whatever uh, Thomas Jefferson or Patrick Henry was saying uh, in, in, in the halls of, of Congress. So if we want to know why we can never again replicate this extraordinary generation, there's, there's a very simple answer. The growth of what we today presumably value most about our society, our culture, egalitarian democracy. Um, in the early 19th century, the voices of ordinary people, at least ordinary white people, began to be heard as never before in history. And I think that's the, 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 the lesson of this period. Um, and they soon overwhelmed the high-minded desires and aims of the revolutionary leaders who had brought them into being. I mean, this notion of democracy has a you saw that if you, if you favor gay rights, you saw what happens. It's one thing for the legislature to pass it in Maine, but as soon as it's put out uh, for a vote, then it gets defeated. And that's true of the EU, for example. Think of it. As soon as the thing gets out in the people, as long as it's confined to the elites making decisions in the legislatures, the EU was building its constitution. But they, had a, they created a constitution, if you remember, a few years ago. And then in their naivete, they sent it out to the French and the Dutch for a vote. And in both states, it was defeated. Now, it's one thing to get defeated in Ireland. It's another thing to have these core states of the EU uh, repudiating the constitution. So what did they do? They just pull it back and they change a few words and turn it into a treaty, which can then be passed by a legislature. And the poor Irish, in their naivete, still were committed to a referendum, and it got defeated. Well, they had a new referendum. The pressure on the Irish were, was immense, and they passed it. So now it looks as if the EU ha now has its constitution. But it's a, not, it's a crazy constitution. It's not ratified. You have to look at what the founders did. And they created their constitution. At least they set it out to 
13 states for ratification. Now, they, they said, we only wait. We're not, not, unlike the U, EU, they didn't ask for unanimity. They said, only nine states. Madison was very shrewd about that, because he realized they could never get unanimity. My own state didn't even show up for the convention. So, so this notion of democracy can have, it has its cutting edge side. Uh, the founders had succeeded only too well in promoting democracy and equality among ordinary people. And in fact, I think by doing that, by promoting democracy, they prevented any duplication of themselves. But their contribution to our, to our citizenship, our sense of citizenship, lives on. They created the institutions and values by which we still conduct our political business. They passed on ideals and standards of political behavior that helped to contain and control the unruly materialistic passions unleashed by the democratic uh, revolutions of, of that early 19th century. Even today, our aversion to corruption, and we talk about this with the Afghan government. Where they find, I'm sure uh, they, they, the Afghans are totally be bewildered by our notions of corruption. They don't understand that at all, because you, you know, corruption, the other side of corruption is doing something for your friends. And those who are in your tribe or your friends, I mean, that's what corruption is. And they simply f probably find our constant talk about telling Kazai to get rid of corruption, he doesn't fully comprehend what we're talking about. Because that came out of this generation. Our aversion to corruption was built into the revolution. We thought the British system was built on corruption. That's why we have separation of powers. The British system, we thought, was corrupt. That is, the British Crown Ministry was appointing members of the House of Commons to crown offices. But we know today that's exactly how the cabinet system works. Every member of Gordon Brown's cabinet is a member of the parliament, either the House of Lords or the House of Commons. Has to be. They have to have dual offices. That's what we broke, because we thought that was corruption. You're buying off the assembly. So we wrote into our state constitution an absolute prohibition on this kind of office holding. So we prevented ourselves from ever developing, presumably ever, a parliamentary cabinet system. So corruption is a funny thing. But we have, they gave us that. They gave us this aversion. Uh, and and the, our uneasiness over the blatant uh, promotion of special interests and our yearning for examples of unselfish uh, political behavior, all, I think, uh, are legacies of this generation. They suggest that the ideals of, of, uh, of this revolutionary generation still have great moral power, and they still guide our politics. And, and I, for that reason, I think we'll always be in their debt. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I'll be happy to take uh, questions, comments. Yes, yes. I'm sorry, I, missed, I, I understood you said something about the role of the church. I, I can talk about that. And, and the industriousness, yeah, out of this generation of these middling people, and this is a central theme in this new book on Empire of Liberty, it, it are all those people who created the inventions, the, uh, the businesses that, that made the northern parts of America really quite prosperous and, and, and very productive. Um, more so than any other place in, in the planet at the, at the time. So you're freeing up uh, inventiveness of, of, of middling sorts of people who had no education but were self-taught. Uh, you know, the kind of person that uh, Peter Cooper, for example, who created Cooper Union, uh, comes out of this period. So that there's, and there are more patents um, issued per capita in, in the United States than, than in England itself in this period. There's another outbursting of inventiveness. Now, as far as the church goes, religion gets democratized in a remarkable way in this period. I mean, you, you start, in 1760, there's not a single Methodist in America. Not a single one. Uh, by 1810, the Methodists are the largest group in America. Even though John Wesley, the leader, the originator of Methodism, 
was opposed to the American Revolution. Nonetheless, the Methodists just take off and for several reasons. One, because they had no learned clergy. They had itinerant preachers who were horseback preachers, had no training. They didn't have DDs. They didn't go to college. They just get out there and preached, and they were pulling in the souls by, by the, you know, the thousands. And so the, the Baptists and the Methodists take control of American, evangelical groups take control of American culture by 1810, 1820. So that's an extraordinary change from the pre-revolutionary period. You had the Anglicans and, and the Congregationalists, the Puritans. Uh, and, and by the end of the period, you have a, this outburst of evangelical. So there's a radical change in religious life uh, in this period. Now, this gentleman over here had a question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in my class, so um, one of the things I've been struggling with is the term uh, radicalism. radicalism. Uh, one thing is that you have radicals like Benjamin Franklin or John Jay. I mean, even or you hear about radicals like them, but you don't really hear about the common people. So what was it that they embodied? I guess why do we see them as radicals and not the common people? Or what could they be considered radicals as well? Well, it depends on what you mean by common people. Uh, the middling sorts of people who, that I'm talking about who had no education, who never went to Harvard or Princeton, but um, create uh, businesses, create uh, prosperity, cre invent left and right. These people uh, come to celebrate work and, and uh, really transform the culture of the North. Uh, and, and that's a radical tra change. Now, I consider that, that's what I mean by radical change. A ra a, I mean an extreme change. That's what I mean by radical root change. And I think you do get that in America. I mean, the difference between American society in 1760 and American society in 1810 or 1820 is just fantastic. I mean, just a great transformation. From the north, in the north, the south remains very much an 18th century hierarchical society. So when Southerners on the eve of the Civil War look, say, we, didn't, we haven't changed. We're truer to the founders than, than you guys in the North. They're absolutely right. It's the North that has undergone a fantastic uh, democratization of the economy, of the society, of the culture. Uh, and, and it's the South that's bewildered by, by, this, by this change. And, and, uh, so I, that's what I mean by radical, extreme root kind of transformation. Uh, if you think of it as in, in Marxist terms as the proletariat taking over, it's probably in Marxist terms what it is is a lower middle class taking over. But I, I don't think Marx's categories apply to, to what happens in, in America here. It's, it's what they call middling sorts of people who really displace the um, this, this gentry, this aristocratic gentry. Now, they're not aristocrats by European standards, but they certainly are aristocrats by the standards of uh, William Finley, who is my, one of my favorite characters. He's a Scotch-Irish uh, Westerner from, from uh, Irishman from Pennsylvania, uh, Western Pennsylvania, and he takes on the uh, Eastern establishment. He never went to college, but he's a shrewd politician, and, and he, he gives... Uh, the James Wilsons and the uh, uh, Robert Morrises in Philadelphia a real, a real tough time. And he becomes a major popular figure, the longest serving congressman in the House of Representatives in, at, at the time. Uh, that, if that's the kind of, or, or uh, you know, there's a whole series, Matthew Lyon from Vermont. He's very wealthy, but he didn't go to college. And uh, he's attacked for, for, for being ignorant and being lowly, having obscure origins. And he, he's got a real chip on his shoulder. He becomes a Jeffersonian Republican against the Federalist establishment, who tend to be Congregationalists and, and Puritans, and, and stayed. And, and that, that kind of, of um, if you want to call it class warfare, goes on all through the North in this period. And, and by the by 1815, the North and South have gone in very different directions. One, a slave-dominated society, hierarchical, still clinging to the, even though they're Republicans, that is small r, uh, and, and in fact, the, the leadership of the Democratic Republican Party comes from the South, uh, which is very ironic. Uh, but it's a slave-ridden society, dominated by an aristocracy, uh, 
and, and you have a North which is uh, uh, celebrating work, which itself makes slavery even more conspicuous and objectionable, uh, celebrating work and celebrating uh, economic development, prosperity, and business. Uh, that, that, th those two worlds are already separated, and, and you can see the sectional split uh, emerging. That wasn't obvious in 1776 or 1789. It's not clear that the South and North are going to fall apart. Um, so it, it, it's the, the North is undergoing a really rapid, rapid change, faster than I think we've we fully appreciated. Democratization takes place very quickly. We usually think of the Jacksonian era as the era of the common man, but I see the Jacksonian era as a period of consolidation. I mean, the Jacksonians are, begin resorting to, they're trying to bring this licentious, unruly society under control, and they develop what you might call quasi-monarchical techniques, patronage, the spoil system, using offices to bring people together, control, political offices, um, bureaucracy. Jacksonian bureaucracy is enormous, not by modern standards, but by the previous standards of the, of, of the Jeffersonian era. Uh, so you, and, and Jackson himself, as King Andrew, is, is playing a kind of monarchical role. So in some sense, the Jacksonian period is a period of consolidation and integration. The real democratization is taking place in the first two decades of the, of the 19th century, not in the third and fourth decades. So I, I think there are real changes. At least that's the thrust of my... Uh, my book. <laughs> and I think I can document this. I mean, just a period of unbelievable uh, instability and chaos. Uh, I'll give you one drinking. Alcohol consumption reaches a high by 1815 uh, that we've never duplicated since five gallons per person. Now, that doesn't seem too much, but every man, woman, and child drinking five gallons of whiskey a, a year. Uh, and, 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 uh, this, this, and when you consider that a fifth of the population was enslaved and didn't have much access to alcohol, that, the figures are even higher. And, and people were worried about it. That's why the temperance movement emerges. People really got scared. We're, we're breeding a nation of drunkards. It was higher than any other nation in the world, with the possible exception of the Scots. Uh, <laughs> they, they were, uh, yeah, whiskey, well, they, they live off whiskey. But we, we were doing the same. I mean, gr uh, we, we, uh, grain producers found whiskey to be a much more easily port portable product than, than wheat itself, which is perishable. So uh, by distilling it into whiskey, it, it was... Uh, and so whiskey was available everywhere. People had whiskey breaks. They didn't take coffee breaks. Uh, so it's a... That, that, that college rioting. We had more college riots between 1798 and 1808 than at any time in our history. I mean, Nassau Hall in... in Princeton was burned, gutted, presumably set by students. Uh, colleges would be closed for weeks on end. Half classes would be expelled. Half the class. I mean, the classes were 120, and 60 students would be expelled. But that's an enormous kind of, these riots went on for a decade, up and down the East Coast. Uh, so this is a period, I mean, we think of the 1960s as being a period of rioting. Nothing compares to this early period. I could go on. There are just all kinds of measures of of a society that's in complete disarray, but still holding together simply because uh, a lot of people were making money. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah, there's a question. Could you comment on uh, those supporters that have argued that the New England states acquiesced in slavery in the Constitution because they had an economic slave trade and the uh, shipping of the uh, tax goods well, there's no doubt that the, uh, that, that the New England states had participated in the slave trade, including my own state of Rhode Island, was probably the most notorious. Of course, the, that gets stopped. The slave trade actually, ev they, they even begin limiting the slave trade before 1808, despite what the Constitution says in various ways. Uh, New Englanders, generally speaking, were not uh, supporting slavery. They, they took leadership, and that, of course, has rescued the Federalists for many modern historians who, the Federalists always had a bad press because of this, uh, the Alien and Sedition Acts. But uh, because of, uh, of slavery now is a major issue uh, in, in historical writing, and, and the Federalists, who did take a leadership role, uh, 
in, in, um, in, in working to, to abolish slavery. He took a leading role in anti-slave uh, business, um, uh, have, 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 have become, have got a better press among historians because of that. But it's the peculiarities of democracy. As the societies became more democratic, as the Democratic Republicans began winning in control of, say, New York and, and, um, uh, and Pennsylvania, the ironies are immense. What they do is begin taking away the suffrage of free blacks who have been voting for, for decades. Because those free blacks, when not only is there racism involved, uh, because there's an increasing antagonism to, to blacks that hadn't existed earlier, it actually grows, but also because these blacks had supported the Federalists in elections. So this was good politics. At the same time, they, in Pennsylvania and New York, they're giving Irish immigrants who are not yet citizens the right to vote because they would vote for the Democratic Party. So you have democracies are... You know, it's a strange business. Uh, it, you know, has, it cuts all different ways. We, we, as Churchill said, you know, it's the worst system in the government, except there's nothing better. Uh, it has all kinds of anomalies, but that was a fact of, of, of democratic development. Blacks lost their vote, while, uh, while, while Irish non-citizens got the vote, simply because it worked out for the, the politics. I don't think you can make a case that New England was was, uh, I mean, there are businessmen in New England by the 1840s and 50s that have a vested interest in cotton production because they're running textile mills. But I don't think that's uh, uh, saying that the whole population of New England, I, I think they generally were anti-slave uh, and, and caused no end of trouble, of course, for the, for the South, uh, which at that point is, is is a besieged. See, what's interesting is, as I said, Virginia's top dog in 1776. They think they're the nation. They, as Virginia goes, so does in the United States. By 1820, uh, Virginia is a beleaguered. It's still a larger state in population, but already has a sense that it's declining. Its wealth is declining. It's, it's, people are leaving. Um, and, and as I say, its principal export by, by the second decade of the 19th century is, is slaves. Uh, so you have a sense of, of, of the South seeing itself as a besieged minority, even though it's in control of the, of the national government through the whole antebellum period, they have a real sense that the future does not belong to them. It's because of the, the world's condemnation of slavery. Uh, and, and I think that, that's a big, big change. Any other? Here's one. Oh, wait a minute. We've got one more for this young fellow here. Can you speak on the original intentions of the Electoral College? The Electoral College? The Electoral College, as you know, is a very awkward situation we have. Uh, it came about because, not because people were frightened of democracy. They, it was proposed by James Wilson, of all people. Well, well maybe we should have direct election of the president by the people. But then people said, well, how would they know whom to vote for? There are no parties. You have to understand there are no parties in 1787. Nobody conceived of parties. They hated parties. They didn't imagine parties emerging. And there's no mass media. So how would you know, once you get past George Washington, whom to vote for? Well, they didn't know. They just said, the people will never know. They could vote for, you know, in Massachusetts, they'll vote for John Hancock. In Virginia, they'll vote for Jefferson. Or, but how would you know who's important in another state? How would you go about organizing? They couldn't even imagine what we have today, a party system with primaries and so on. So they said, well, we'll have to have a, a more indirect. Let's let the Congress elect the president. All right, that sounds good. But well, well, wait a minute. The, then the president would be dependent on the Congress. And he would feel he would lack his independence. All right, we'll make him one term. He'll have a term of seven years. And, and he won't, once he's elected, he won't have to kowtow to the Congress, because he'll be free from, from worrying about reelection. And they said, yeah, but seven years is too long. And this is how it went, back and forth, back and forth. They just didn't know what to do. And they finally said, someone came up with the idea, well, let's create an alternative Congress. And then think about it. That's what the Electoral College is, just another Congress. You're going to have, it's the same number of, you have the same number of electoral votes as you have congressmen and senators. And that's how they thought this Congress would be elected. They would be just as independent as the existing Congress, as the regular Congress. And they would vote 
because they, the, they would be elites and they would know whom to vote for in other states. They couldn't vote for more than one person from their own state. That's the way it reads. And so that was the solution. It seemed at the time very sensible, uh, but it never really worked out. Once you got past Washington, the whole thing fell apart and, and uh, it never has worked the way they intended it. Uh, now, of course, these electors are simply, uh, they just vote whatever the popular vote is. Now there are all kinds of, every once in a while one of these electors decides to cast his independent vote. It's never created a crisis because we never needed that extra vote. But some people say, for example, voted for Wallace when, instead of for Nixon in 68 or whatever. I mean, they just independently said, I'm not going to vote for what, what I'm supposed to vote for. But l legally, they're supposed to. I think most of the states require the electors to vote the way they But you can see how it arose. It, it wasn't anything that was, people weren't trying to just avoid democracy. They just couldn't anticipate how you would go about electing a president. They couldn't anticipate parties, and they couldn't anticipate modern media. Um, it's just one of those. I mean, so many things turn out differently from the way they're intended. I mean, that, if you want to talk about the iron law of history, is that nothing, nothing big ever works out the way the <laughs> perpetrators intended. I mean, think of any event. The Reformation? Do you think Martin Luther would have nailed those things to the wall? If he could have seen what, he, what, he, what happened? I mean, he would have said, no way. Am I breaking up the Catholic Church for this? Uh, and so, you know, it, it, nothing works out. The, and certainly the, 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 the revolution, the Constitution, every one of these founders who lived into the 19th century died disillusioned. Believe it or not, they died disillusioned with what they had wrought. It wasn't what they expected. It was much too commercial, much too money-making, much too democratic. It wasn't as high-minded as they expected. Um, and, and even Jefferson, who was a Pollyanna, is really bewildered by, by what's happening. He blames it all on, on, on a bunch of Federalists and the clergymen up in New England. Uh, <laughs> but he just, he, even he was shaking his head at what had happened. I mean, he lived with illusions. He thought the whole world, the latest 1820 says, well, the whole world, everyone now alive is going to be, uh, everyone now born will, will die a, a Unitarian. I mean, how could he be so? <laughs> the Baptists and Methodists are growing by loops and, <laughs> leaps and bounds, and he thinks they're all going to become Unitarians? I mean, he just had no idea what was happening. And the only one I know of who died happy, or his, lived, his, ancient, his, his old age was happy, was Car Charles Carroll, who was the last signer alive for the Declaration of Independence. He was going around giving talks and, of course, collecting money for these. It was like, you know, Pete Rose going around selling his autograph. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't get that. Well, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but he, he, would, he was making money off of the fact that he was the last signer. And, and he would go around and give speeches. And he loved it. He loved the celebrity status. But he's the only one, it seems to me, that, that lived into these late years. I mean, Madison lives a long time, but his, his, his address to the nation, which was, pub was posthumously published, is really a, uh, a note of despair, because he senses the Civil War coming. Um, you know, they either sense that, that the nation was going to break up, or they, the world has become too crass and materialistic. It, it was not a, but they, but they're a new generation that were happy with what, you know, they, the, the new generation is happy with the new America. That's the, the nature of old age. It, it really uh, you. You, you get uh, you think the world's going to hell in a handbasket because because it makes it easier to leave it you know <laughs> <laughs> all right okay Thank you.